It's an old town. There's a river that runs right through the middle of it. And a lot of old homes, which are nice to look at, but they're not exactly energy efficient. I've been working in this town for uh, for 10 years now, and I've been doing a lot of sustainability and community projects here. So for smart cities, for example, like our, we're going to develop a 10-year plan mm -hmm. to get people out of energy poverty, right? Because there's a lot of work that needs to happen. It's like this fine balance between understanding that there's this there's this massive problem and it's pretty harsh, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time that there's this that there's this opportunity to make a difference, but that it's gonna take time and it's gonna take work to get there. I would think that a lot of our clients, the ones who are seeking counseling and support um, at Second Story are living in poverty, and energy poverty is one of the manifestations of a larger picture of poverty. Energy poverty is, is is one aspect of the life of a person on a, on a limited or, or very minimal income. And one has to make choices about food and housing and so on. I see some of the people, um, you know, if they can't pay their power bill, get evicted. Uh, then if you've got uh, some with children, where are they going to go? So then again, there's children that's taken in by children's aid. There's a long-term, perhaps, effect on, on those children because of that. Marital breakups. For work, people here usually do fast food, cashier, uh, Michelin, uh, and nurse, nursing, and trade work. Anything that can get you top dollar because you need it to be able to live here. So you're working 30, 32 hours a week, still at minimum wage, it's not enough to support yourself. And I'm a prime example. I worked for a big company for eight years, making just above minimum wage. I wasn't taking home enough to support myself, let alone me and my two kids. I used to work at the recycling facility many years ago until I got sick. Mm. And uh, now, now I can't uh, do anything, any physical labor whatsoever. Joey had a heart attack at 42. Uh, now he has an aneurysm growing and uh, severe COPD <coughs> and I had a stroke. See, no. people understand what muscular dystrophy is, but myotonic means nervous system, so the signals aren't getting across. Because no, when you're on a fixed income, you got to choose between food, uh, medication, and a roof over your head before. So you gotta juggle what's more important. Yes, it is a choice, and it's a choice at the end of the month, whether you will have enough money for the power bill or your rent. And at that point, you've been to the food bank, and that's it. You have no extra. So that's why they do call us. We never knew what we were gonna to have to sacrifice month to month. It was either we would go a little bit without enough food or the power would get shut off. I can't even afford to go out and buy clothes for myself. Mm -hmm. It's been years since I bought new clothes. Okay, on $1,200 a month, like I said, our rent is $500. So at least seven. Then we have our phone, our lights, our cable, and maintenance and gas for the car. And then we split what's left between the power bill and the groceries. Declaring bankruptcy. <laughs> that was not an easy thing to do. I declared bankruptcy. Uh, getting rid of the car. Hmm. Couldn't afford to fix it. So. so 
So what they look at doing is taking and saving and pulling from groceries or maybe taking money from uh, extracurricular activities. You know, we like it when birthdays roll around and you get 10 bucks in your birthday card. Woohoo! I mean, that's free money, but still, there it goes. You know, that's bread and milk. Run an electric heat in a Swiss cheese trailer that, with the door locked and bolted, the wind in the wintertime literally blow the door open, even though it was bolted. And that, just, well, they told it was, the power bill would be $150 a month. Their first bill was $900. Like I said, this house is not insulated. We don't own this place, we rent this place. She does have all new windows in it, except three. But those three are leaking, the, it all leaks around the door. And we clean the pellet stove regularly, make sure it runs efficiently. Yeah, we were just bare minimum, like using the stove, just, just you know, trying to keep it down, because we found the first bill was like way too high. Barely could cover that. You just can't keep keep it paid you up. Can't keep it paid up. I mean, it went. I mean, we are on our final payment of last winter's power bills. I've lived in the same mini home for 20 yeah. years, and when I first moved in there, I was paying $95 a month. Yes. A year ago, I was up to $270 yeah. dollars a month. Because it's gone up 91% in the last 15 years, I think that in itself is a problem. The fact that we let it get to that point in itself is a problem. Now we have to try and reverse it, which makes it even more difficult. Any place with electric heat is unless the, the power is included, is we'd never ever go near it now. Because we just the can't, hard way. We can't afford it You either going to freeze to death or you're paying eight, nine hundred dollars a month for power. The electric heat is just ridiculous. So you, you can nowadays. never budget what, if you're paying it yourself, you have your rent as a certain amount and you never know what the power bill is going to be when it comes. You just yeah hope that you have enough money at the end of the month to pay it. I experienced energy poverty uh, living with my parents when I was probably from middle school to high school. And it was hard. It definitely put strain on my parents' relationship and our relationship as a family. Not that there weren't good times, but I think because of the stress from living in energy poverty, there were also a lot of bad times that we didn't need to have. The kids that are not focusing in the classroom, um, that the behaviors sometimes come out that because they can't concentrate, they have no food in their stomachs. Going to school, you know, I kind of put on a front that I was, I kind of always tried to make everyone else laugh so that no one would focus on me because really I was stressed and kind of depressed about the situation at home. I didn't know what I'd be going home to or if my parents would be fighting because they were stressed out. I didn't really try to do good on my work because I didn't think it mattered compared to the bigger issues. The families were dealing with uh, bills that didn't get paid huge transportation issues in that area because of the very rural nature of it. Um, and um, I, I knew of a parent who would walk to, she didn't have transportation and couldn't afford to take a cab. And the closest grocery store was many kilometers away and she walked from her home into town to pick up the few groceries that she could afford and walk back. And, you know, we have to come together as a community to help these families. And we do have a lot of families that are struggling. And you might not see it on the surface um, because it is, you know, you're proud. You don't want to sometimes ask for help, but it's families are really struggling out there. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes trying to help. But like we said before, it's just Band-Aid. We've said it all. It's just this helping somebody over this hurdle. They're, they've fallen flat on their face, they don't know where to turn. And it takes courage, 
to phone to say, I need help. Salvation Army and the Lions the Club. Lions Club and the Inner Church. St. Joseph's. Yeah. And how did it feel having to ask them for help? Belittling. Embarrassing. Um Makes you feel ashamed. The greatest impact is, is on the mental well-being of people living in energy poverty, always having to struggle um, and be concerned about where their where their money's going and, and what they're going to be able to uh, to have to eat, to eat well, to have a place over their head. Those things have an impact on the health. As much as we try to help out, there's a limit in what we what we can do. So again, we partner with other organizations as St. Vincent de Paul, Lions Club, those places, and say to people, you know, we can help you with so much. But if we had to help everyone that come in with the dollar cents that they owe on their hydro bill, we'd be out of money in, you know, two months at, at, at least. So 79 calls in the month of October. It's just getting worse. Last year was incredible. This year's, we know that, that we have to work that much harder to approach people for the funds to cover all these other people. It has its moments. It's uh, depressing. It's irritating. Uh, it causes problems. But then we sat and think, you know, it's not that bad. There's so many people out there that has it so much worse. So with that in our mind, we proceed on with our day and very thankful for what we have. I'd like to see a lot more solar and wind power. I just, yeah. I mean, I, well, that'd be mm. great here. I mean, we're, we're already paying, everything's included, but the, I'm sure that mm. if they put that in here, the landlords would see such a difference in how much money they'd make and, yeah. and how much they'd save. Maybe pass it along to the tenants. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure. If, yeah, if you have places that don't cost seven, eight hundred dollars a month to power, well, your rent's gonna cost less and have more money to go and do anything, and buy the stuff, or maybe have a car. <laughs> so I think if we had strategies to help with energy reduction or energy savings, that they there's hope. I'm really inspired by the Bridgewater Town Council's prioritizing of energy poverty in this project to say we're going to do this. I absolutely think that this will bring the community together and I think this this project has um, a real opportunity and why I'm so excited about it is that this is actually a concrete poverty reduction strategy. If you live in uh, isolated silos then you don't have a sense that you, you, know, you have someone that you can reach out to for help. But if you have a sense of community when problems happen, you may be able to work through some of these problems like energy poverty. The people that are out there in need um, need a voice. They need a voice in the community. And I really hope with this energy poverty uh, program that these individuals, we have to give them a face. My hopes are that, as an adult, I can get out of that kind of lifestyle and not end up the way my parents did, because that's also a hope they have for me.